Welcome to episode 381 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer, director Nathaniel Nguyen, who just did a horror thriller called Voices. He's another writer, director living far from Los Angeles and still figuring out ways to get his movies made. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. The regular deadline is May 31st. After that, it goes up by $10. And then the final deadline is July 31st. So if your script is ready, definitely submit now before the final deadline. We're looking for low budget shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than 1 million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading scripts in the later rounds. We've given away thousands in cash and prizes. I had last year's winner, Richard Pierce, on the podcast in episode 378. He won the contest and was introduced to one of our industry judges who took the script to Mar Vista Entertainment and got the film produced. So check out that episode to learn more about last year's winner again that's episode 378 with Richard Pierce this year we have a short film script category 30 pages or less so if you have a low budget short script by all means submit that as well I've got a number of industry judge producers who are looking for short scripts once again if this sounds like something you might like to learn more about or perhaps enter just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest if you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 381. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a whole bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I teach you how to write a professional logline and career letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I am working on. We are still meeting with distributors on the Rideshare Killer. I want to do a really a full podcast episode about this process, just going through finding a sales agent, finding a distributor. So once we make a decision about what direction we are going to go, um, hopefully I can give a little more details. I've been talking um, with my buddy Bernie Rayo, who um, you might remember was the cinematographer on my film, The Pinch, and he's been experimenting with the Unreal Engine, which if you haven't heard about it, it's a video game engine but allows you to create photorealistic 3D virtual worlds. So potentially you could shoot your actors on a green screen and then drop them into whatever sci-fi or fantasy world you wanted and do all this fairly easy and fairly cheaply too. The technology and the computers and all getting much, much, much more powerful and much, much cheaper. So we've been kicking around some ideas on that front. If you have any experience using the Unreal Engine, please do drop me a line. I'd love to see some of the stuff you guys have created and um, just learn more about it to learn what you guys have done um, with it if anybody has done anything with the unreal engine it just seems like there's a lot of potential here for for indie filmmakers especially as a fan myself you know a real fan of, of sci-fi and, and some of these big sci-fi epic movies um, this is sort of a window into that um, potentially where you don't need to necessarily raise a hundred million dollars to make a sci-fi you know kind of an epic sci-fi film so anyways that's things I've been working on over the last week now let's get into the main segment today I am interviewing writer director Nathaniel Nuon. Here is the interview. Welcome Nathaniel to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Uh, thanks for having me, man. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, I actually uh, was born in Cambodia. I grew up, uh, I came here when I was about four. So uh, yeah, and uh, growing up I was, um, you know, we didn't really have a lot. Um, uh, my dad brought home or brought home a TV, a uh, broken TV, and he fixed it, and, uh, you know, it played, uh, it, it was in black and white, but it only played uh, the video portion of it, so, uh, you know, growing up, I was just watching, you know, the TV with no sound, and just making up uh, dialogue, I guess, on what I was watching, and, you know, that, that I think that's my first experience to, like, uh, 
putting something together imaginally like on, on screen so ever since then yeah and so then how did you start to actually turn that into a career did you go to film school did you just pick up a video camera start shooting little videos what were those first steps like yeah uh growing up and i mean when you know obviously during uh our my teenage years we i uh shot a bunch of stuff with my friends just you know random backyard videos and uh after uh, i graduated high school uh four of our friend the four of us uh from high school went to a uh, full cell in orlando we graduated from full cell and then kind of start like you know um well, working in our career path to where we are now so mm-hmm. gotcha gotcha where are you located now are you still in florida or you're out here in la no, I'm actually in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, Mobile, Alabama. Okay, so and how did you end up there? And just as a sort of a, a, I get a lot of people asking, do I need to move to LA? What is your take on that? Why are you in Alabama and why not move to LA? <laughs> well, when my, uh, you know, that's where I was raised. Uh, you know, my parents moved to Alabama uh, when I think I was uh, maybe eight or nine. So I've been here. Uh, I mean, I graduated high school here. So, uh, you know, I went, I lived, uh, when I, we lived in Orlando for, you know, the, for the film school portion of our, uh, you know, and then I moved to LA, lived in LA for about two years, you know, trying to make it out there as well. Uh, it wasn't until like Katrina hit the, the coast, uh, like my mom's uh, home was completely destroyed. So I had to kind of come back and take care of her. And, you know, and that's kind of what kind of started the whole thing uh, as far as filmmaking. I just started doing, uh, I did a short that uh, back in Alabama, it was about, you know, Cambodia uh, residue, which that, you know, one, uh, two Emmys. And then that's kind of like where I kind of started. Like I said, well, I really don't want to, I didn't really need to go back to LA. Uh, so, and then all suddenly, you know, the boom of, uh, Atlanta and, and New Orleans film, uh, uh, production started, uh, growing here. So we were getting a bunch of like spills from like New Orleans, uh, shows that were like, wasn't shooting in New Orleans, but wanted a, you know, smaller town looking New Orleans. So it kind of moved into Mobile. So mm-hmm. I was able to start working on, uh, productions that in, in my home state. So, uh, and then that's kind of like where, you know, we built a, built a little, um, uh, team together here and, uh, so I was moving into uh, you know, what I'm producing now. So. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm curious again, I get a lot of emails, um, from people outside of LA. How do you find these local opportunities? Like you're talking about obviously Atlanta and, um, and, and Louisiana, we sort of hear there's film incentives. So we know there's things, but how do you pipe into that? And how were you getting these jobs and what were you doing on them? Did you have some like production experience from college that you were able to sort of use to get some, some, some of these jobs, but number one, how do you find them? And then, then ultimately how do you land those jobs? Well, I mean, you know, like anything, you just kind of have to know somebody who's already in it. And then, you know, once you get on a show, it's it's pretty easy. You know, the, either the producers or the line producer just kind of calls you back. You know, uh, when I first, uh, my first big show here was uh, I was doing a DI work. So I was a DIT and I, you know, I have a very strong uh, post-production background uh, when, uh, when it comes to like that kind of stuff and editing. So, you know, it was just an easy transition for me just to, to do it and, you know, I, uh, so I was DIing for like, you know, for about two, three years, uh, before I, I decided to, I wanted to stop doing it and actually start directing and producing, uh, myself. But, uh, yeah, I still get calls now like, Hey, you want to, you want to DI for this show? I'm like, uh, I'm, you know, I'm moving, you know, it's, it's yeah, moving into a different, uh, phase in my career. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it really is, it's just, um, Kind of networking, you know, just getting on there and, and trying to figure out what department you you want to do and mm-hmm. uh, you know, and work your way in there. Yeah, and how do you make that transition? You're on set. Um, do you start telling people, "Hey, I'm gonna be, I want to be a writer, I want to be a producer, a director"? Did you start writing scripts? Did you start promoting yourself? Um, at this point, you probably had a little reservoir of names that you could, you know, people you had met and a net, little network. But what were those steps to actually going from DIT to you know producing and directing stuff? And how do you let the world know that you're changing? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, like when you're on set, I, mean, I try not to like. Uh, oversell or sell myself you know a lot of times you know what are you everybody who's on set are usually trying to move up the ladder you know so you kind of to meet people and you know like hey you know the camera operator eventually wants to, to dp you know so every, everybody's always trying to you know move up somewhere um and then you know there's an opportunity where you're like hey let's let's try to work together and you know some of the people i've uh, i actually um are working with and producing films with uh you know when we were working on the show together they were like you know in different departments and now they're like the head production designer now on for our, our show. So, you know, it's just one of those things that you just have to kind of 
you know, feel you feel your way out. You don't want to be that guy like, hey, you know, pushing it onto the producers and stuff because that sometimes gets really annoying. And then, you know, so you just kind of have to like pick pick and choose your battles. Uh, for me, I was just, you know, I, I I was doing really well. I saved up some money and I was like, you know, I just need to stop because I could keep DIing for the rest of my life. And it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a good gig. It's just that, I, you know, my, my, my passion was to produce and, and write and direct. So uh, I just said, like, uh, I basically helped a friend out, like saying with the network things. Hey, uh, I can train you to be a DI. So the next show that comes in or call me, I'll just recommend you. And that's what I did. So I just trained uh, a good friend of mine, and he started DI. So mm-hmm. and then I just you know, stepped away and and uh, started writing and focusing on my my own path. Gotcha. So let's talk about that first um, short residue. Um, talk about that a little bit. How did you get that funded? Was it self-funded? And then what did you do with it? Did you send it to festivals? And then ultimately, how do you look back and, and feel like that helped your career? Uh, yeah, it was self-funded, man. It's a, <laughs> it's just super low budget. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a couple thousand dollars. And then, you know, it's just uh, after we finished, I did, we pretty much did everything. Uh, I did, you know, the majority of all the editing and all the stuff. And then uh, we sent it out to bunch of festivals. I, honestly, I, I was just doing it as an experimental film. I, I didn't really think that it was going to do what it did. And, w- you know, when it hit festivals, it was just, I guess, the, the, the subject matter and the topic was so intriguing to everybody uh, that, you know, it just started, you know, picking up awards and, you know, then we were able to get to larger festivals. Um, but, you know, when for that, it just taught me that, like, I can, you know, definitely be able to go that route as far as, like, the festival route. But, you know, I, I, I you know, making shorts and, and winning festival don't really pay the bills in a sense. So, <laughs> so, you know, you had to kind of think commercially, like how do you make something and make uh, a living doing it, uh, but still like, you know, be able to produce art that you, you, you care about and have passion for. Uh, so that's kind of like how I start restructuring some stuff um, mm-hmm. in my life to, to make sure that like, you know, I'm, I'm producing stuff that can be marketable and then sold. Yeah. Yeah. And so just quickly, and we'll get into um, voices here in a second. What I think you, what you just said, I think is so interesting is, you know, how do you um, navigate those rough waters of, you know, commercial versus artistic? Um, Obviously on a low budget film like this, there has to be a commercial aspect to it in order to try and make your money back, give yourself the best chance of making your money back. But just talk about that a little bit going into this, and maybe we can even get into voices. Um, What were some of those determining factors on settling on this type of a movie so you know when we were looking at um the uh production of like you know we did we did one that was a super low budget uh, around you know 10 grand just for like uh as, as a feature and actually um it's getting picked up now too so it's one of those things that like i was looking at like what can i do for what i have and also like you know the the uh you know my to my disposal around me the, to make it the big production values one of the things you know as long as it looks good the story's pretty solid you know, you're going to get some sort of distribution picked up, you know, it's like, so, you know, when you, when you look at it from that aspect, you know, for me, I was just trying to like, hey, I, I just want to make a film and then make sure that I can, you know, recoup what I'm putting into it and also like make a living out of it. Um, you know, and when you write, you know, the genres that we, uh, we had to kind of like stay with, stay in the lane, you know, obviously it's either some sort of horror or, uh, you know, um, something that, you know, that's easily kind of a seasonal thing. So it was just, uh, th- that's why it was just picking up voices. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big sci-fi fan and, uh, you know, I didn't have any horror ideas except for, for voices. So it was just, the, you know, the logical thing to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's, yeah, let's dig into voices a little bit more. Um, maybe to start out, you can give us a quick pitch or a log line. What is this film all about? A visually impaired woman that she hears dead people. And <laughs> so she, uh, you know, she's, She's trying to figure out um, why, why they're at, you know, why they're talking to her, and you know, and without ruining you know um, a lot of the, the plot. But uh, you know, she she's pregnant, and uh, they, she's kind of the gateway for her uh, for them to come back to the world of living. So gotcha, gotcha. And where did this idea come from? What was the sort of the genesis of this story of a a woman who can hear dead people's voices? Well, it's actually uh, uh, based off of my mom's dream. I was uh, when, you know when I came back. Uh, moved back to Alabama, uh, her and I were having lunch one day and we were just talking and somehow the topic of dreams came out. She was just telling me about this reoccurring dream that she had uh, about a little girl um, knocking on our door and asking to stay with us. And she kept on telling her, no, no, no. And it's, she said it happened for weeks and then she finally agreed and let the little girl in. And she told the dream to my grandma and my grandma was just like, well, you're pregnant and you're going to have a baby girl. And then nine months later, my sister was born. 
<laughs> so I, you know, I thought that was an interesting idea. And in more research I did, I, I found out that like, it's heavily rooted in our Southeast Asian culture that, uh, you know, a pregnant woman uh, develops some sort of like super hyper sixth sense in a sense. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I thought that was always interesting. And then they're like, you know, souls that are trapped or tormented has the ability to come back if the woman allows them to, you know, take the possession of the baby so mm -hmm. and they can come back and live the karma out and you, you know, move on to the, the, the next life after. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's um, that's fascinating. And it's a really high concept premise. Reminds me a little bit of Sixth Sense, the way you're, except instead of I see dead people, you hear dead people. Um, a similar, yeah, similar high concept. So let's talk about your writing process a little bit. Um, where do you typically write and when do you typically write? Do you have a home office? It looks like we're looking at your home office. Do you go to Starbucks um, and do you need that ambient noise? Do you write in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening? What does sort of your writing schedule look like? I uh, actually just do a lot of it here. Um, you know, I uh, have my board here. Actually, this is it's mm -hmm. uh, the notes for like um, structure for voices. Uh, you know, and I, I have a writing partner, Daniel Halfcock, and uh, he, you know, him and I kind of like do what we do here on either on Zoom. We're just spitballing ideas. You know, we we get an outline, we structure it first, and then try to figure out like, you know, the beats for each of the the, the stories. Um, and you know, it's just really fleshing out the characters. Once we have an idea, you know, and um, you know, I, I try to find a theme of what, you know, what I'm trying to portray in the story and then find something that I like about the screenplay or what I'm about to write and make sure that I have it in there so that, you know, when I go to make it, it's something that I'm passionate about, mm -hmm. not just something that like, oh, you know, yeah. Uh, so, you know, just trying to find, you know, that, that key thing. Mm -hmm. And how much time do you spend writing once you do get writing? Are you one of these 16 hours a day? Do you typically, um, you know, blast out a draft quickly? Does it take you several months? And then the follow-up question to that is how much time do you spend outlining your script? And then how much time do you spend actually in final draft writing lines of dialogue and action? Uh, it depends on the script. Uh, and also depends on like uh, the idea that uh, how much of it is already set in my head. Um, I tend to write, uh, well, I tend to write the last scene first because I, I have this, philosophy or this theory that like if I know where I'm going to be where I end it's easier to begin to recreate the journey to get there you know so I don't write from the beginning until I actually just write the ending first so like I know what I want to see at the end and then from there I take the characters backwards and then uh, reverse the journey and then I can like uh, during you know the, the, the structures I can figure out like you know where the conflict mm -hmm. needs to fall and um, and just in terms of your outlining stage, how much time would you spend typically before you get into an actual script? Uh, I, I I would say probably a couple of days, you know, just just like because my outline is not really like some people's outline is super detailed. Mm -hmm. Mine's just like because you know more I I, I write in a way is like as as an editor because I spend a lot of time ed you know editing uh, in post so. A lot of times I just write like uh, I outline structurally like scenes, this scene happens here. Like so I'm already like looking, thinking of how the how the film would cut together, you know. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the way, you know, with Daniel and I, Daniel, he's not a, he's he's more of a creative writer. So he has all the, you know, the the, the descriptions that he wants in there. But like, you know, when I, I draw my outline, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like, OK, you know, it's mm -hmm. it almost it almost seems like a, an editor's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, outline chart. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. And um, what what does your development process look like, especially a script like this that um, it sounds like you kind of knew you guys wanted to shoot this from the start? What does your development process look like? You have your co-writer. Do you have some actor friends? Are there some other producers um, that you get it to? And then how do you interpret those uh -huh. notes, um, you know, and then actually go back and try and try and get them into the script or not? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I uh, I do a lot of like table reads and, with, hmm. you know, I have I, I you know, uh, one of our uh, producer, he's an actor as well, and you know we have a lot of uh, in theater, and then we have a lot of uh, stage actors and theater friends who love re doing table reads with us. So, I you know I've got the that that advantage of just being able to hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? They love table reads, so, and then mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of feedback from people just reading it and then telling me like, hey, this doesn't seem right, it doesn't feel right, or it doesn't come off the tongue really. You know, so it's like that's once I get a draft, I feel like I I I like when people for people to read it that we start doing table reads and we, we, we flush it out and, you know, start beginning the revisions, uh, for the project. Um, but yeah, I, I, as far as notes, yeah, I, I get like two pages of notes and I'll look at them and, you know, and just kind of see which one uh, makes sense, which one doesn't, you know, which one works and which one doesn't. So. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I'm curious just about genre requirements, screenplay structure as you're going into this. Um, you know, just like I just mentioned, your pitch was sort of a a, um, a pivot on something like Sixth Sense. Um, how do you approach that? Um, there's certainly a long history of, you know, these sort of horror films um, where there's some films you looked at. Um, there's the old adage, you know, give them the same but different. People trying to, you know, use some of the tropes of these movies, but also, you know, circumvent and come up with sort of original ways of using some of these troops. Maybe just talk about that. How did you go into this script and were there some things you were trying to accomplish that sort of played on past horror movies? I guess I wouldn't, you know, when I was work, developing Voices, it was more of a, a, a supernatural thriller. Um, it had horror elements, but, you know, I knew that uh, I, you know, because it was a story about my mom and I, and, and, and I just wanted to focus, like, you know, heavily on the more of the dramatic side. And, but, you know, we, I, it's like uh, the way I, I look at voices is more of a, like I said, a suspense thriller uh, with a lot of you know, drama. And, you know, I, I wanted to make it an interesting, you know, like a different type of horror, I guess, you know, because you, you could go that way. And I knew that it was going to be marketed as a horror. But, you know, I wanted to, to try like, you know, the style that I would figure like uh, I can create as a filmmaker um, in terms of like, you know, when somebody watches it, you know, like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that, you know, kind of deal. Um, so... Yeah, I, I think that, you know, you just got to, um, that's what I found, like, I was talking about finding something unique about the script. Uh, yeah, that's something, like, I personally was, you know, wanted uh, to do and was drawn to. Okay, so once you finished the script, um, what were the next steps to actually getting it into production? Um, did you have some people ready to watch it? Um, but what was sort of the next steps? You're also a producer, so I'm just curious what those next steps that you sort of take off your writing hat and then start to try and get this thing, um, you know, into production. What were those first steps like? Uh, so, you know, I knew like we had to raise the funds and in order to convince anybody to give you money to do anything, um, you kind of have like, you know, whether, you know, like I, I tend to just go out cause I, I, I have access to, you know, my own, uh, equipment and stuff. So I actually did, uh, a proof of concept. So I shot a, a full on trailer, hired, like, you know, brought in some, uh, some local actors, uh, and play all the roles and we shot a full on like scene and everything. So I had like, um, the tone and look of the, the film what a, uh, like a, a kind of, like I said, a pitch trailer. So uh, I took that and then showed it to a couple investors and then like kind of passed it along, along to some distributors that I was, a uh, sales agent I was actually talking to. And they're like, yeah, you got, you finished the movie, you know, bring it back. We'll, we'll definitely take a look at it. It looks interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's, that's a step. Then you, you take that and go, you know, you talk to your, um, your money guys and it's like, Hey, look, I got some interest in this thing. Here's how, here's how it looks like, you know, I begin the packaging process, you know, like I'll put the, uh, the structure and the budget together and figure like, you know, the shoot dates and we'll break it. You know, we'll, uh, one of, you know, one of my producers, he's also a line producer, so he's able to break down the, uh, the scheduling and stuff for us. So then I'll have like, you know, what I actually need to, uh, to make the film. Uh, so yeah, that's the producing side, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what are some of those steps actually getting the money? It sounds like you're getting all sort of the logistical stuff set up. Um, but do you have any tips for raising money for something like this? Really just have a really, uh, a, a, a strong financial package together. I mean, a lot of the stuff is, you know, as filmmakers look at places like, you know, in Alabama, they give tax credits back for like 35, 25 to 35. So one of the things that, you know, I look at was, okay, you know, what would the investors, you know, want back and, and how do you protect the investments when they give you the, uh, the funds um you know we were we were we were able to you know capitalize on using a tax credit and also you know the the new laws for uh, uh investors like there was section one, one for the tax law so they are able to write off as a loss for i think three years or something like that i have to double check but you know you add that to your package and it's like you know this is you know and then on top of that, we were able to get a rebate back for like 30, up to 35%. So, you know, they're already seeing a return as soon as the movie's finished an audit. So, you know, one of, you know, when you have that in place and then you have a strong package of like, okay, we got a distributor who's going to pick this up for, you know, distribution. So um, it's easy to convince somebody once you have a strategy or a business mm -hmm. plan. Place. Yeah, yeah. And who did you guys typically pitch? Were they, you know, just contacts that you guys had picked up in the film industry? Were they, you know, film industry type people? Were they people outside the film industry? Who are these people that you actually take this package to? Um, everybody. I mean, I I'll just talk to everybody and anybody. You know, anybody's willing to listen. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, we 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 had a bunch of different people that were interested, and then you know, we, it ended up being uh, 
uh, you know, a good friend uh, uh, and actually where uh, he owned the building that uh, we were, our office was in, you know, and we just talked to him and he looked at the package and he was like, yeah, I mean, I'm in. So, I mean, you, you never know who you're going to run into, you know, it's, uh, the, you know, it's just one of those things that, um, you know, you could, you could run into somebody who just looking to spin or, or, or do a film. Uh, and also, it just depends on what kind of film it is, too. You know, so I, I, I talk to different people like, oh, we're not interested in that kind of that kind of project. But you know, if you have something different, let us know. Um, and then there's people who like, you know, investors are like, you know, it just it, it really is just depend on the person. So I have I have a pitch package for each type of investors. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, smart for sure. So I just like to wrap up the interview interviews by asking the guests what they've seen recently that they thought was really great. Is there anything on Netflix, HBO, um, who anything out over the last couple months that you've seen that maybe went a little under the radar that screenwriters could could check out and benefit from? Uh, man, I, uh, I, I, I honestly I've been so wrapped up I haven't even turned on the TV to look at anything. I mean, I've been working on a, I'm actually working on another script right now. Oh, so. Okay, nice. Yeah, so that yeah. Uh, and so let's let's go let's go that direction. What is next for you? Maybe you can talk a little bit about what else you're working on. Oh, uh, we're um I'm doing a I'm doing the genre I I'm comfortable with now. I'm actually doing a sci-fi thriller. So you okay, know it's a nice. little mixture of of, of the uh, I guess you could say a little bit of aliens meet John Carpenter the thing. Uh, so, um, but yeah, and, you know we're we're I'm using um, LED technology like like the Mandalorian to film it to to give a bigger scale of of okay. the world. And how do you do that in Alabama? Do they have us like one of these stages? Oh, I actually, well, my background is in virtual reality. So I have a virtual reality company that I, I started with my partners to, to sustain our lifestyle here. Uh, um, so we can make movies and, you know, we, we were contracted by the military and then now we're doing uh, um, uh, uh, virtual reality simulations for Abbott Medical. So oh, I have, okay. a, I have, I have, yeah, so I have a VR background. So it just, it just, you know, I'm a yeah, virtual yeah. reality developer who makes movies i guess <laughs> yeah 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 that's interesting um how can people see voices do you know what the release schedule is going to be like it's already out uh, it was out like two weeks ago i think and okay. then they uh it's on the video on demand and you know all the uh, platforms like itunes uh amazon and uh, i think youtube so yeah they can definitely uh, uh check it out perfect perfect and what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing twitter facebook a blog website anything you're comfortable sharing i will round up and to put in the show notes i mean instagram is probably going to be the the easiest for me because uh um and you know i'm hardly on facebook i'm not really a big social media person so i, I don't know i should be yeah, <laughs> yeah. what's your handle over on instagram we'll, we'll grab that yeah. Nathaniel, my name, Nathaniel Noon. Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, Nathaniel, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Good luck with this film, and of course, good luck with all your future films as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, hey, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. 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 A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that 
that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation, of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Simon Barrett. He is a screenwriter living here in Los Angeles. He was a writer on the Blair Witch sequel that came out in 2016. He was also one of the writers on the found footage horror film VHS, really cool found footage horror film that came out around 2012. Now he's on the podcast to talk about his latest film seance. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.